Okay, so we're back on uh, track game design, and right now we're going to have a lecture from uh, Kamil Krupinski from Techland. There's a lot of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know, uh, like, if I had only known that I'm going to get the ha hangover day, that you're, <laughs> I'm going to try to speak uh, kind of softer and slower. Sorry, my hats don't blow. Uh, so I promise, if I had only known that I'm going to get the second day, and uh, I would have picked uh, an easier title. <laughs> but <laughs> I promise it's going to be very clear in a, in a minute. But uh, just to get it out of the way, we're going to be talking about challenging assumptions as a method for better narrative, narrative and game design. And yeah, it sounds kind of cryptic, but it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be clear uh, in just a matter of minutes. So just to get it out of the way, I um, started my career as a game journalist for one of the biggest print uh, magazines about video games in Europe. And then I moved to Techland. I'm here uh, currently as a narrative designer, and I help make them. The, uh, I help make the uh, help with Dying Light the following. Uh, so uh, since we are working on uh, unannounced titles right now, they're triple A's and they're very cool and huge and really amazing. I can't wait to tell you everything about them, but I can't. Uh, so <laughs> I can obviously can't talk about this right now. So I'm going to tell you uh, something about the following. So about, about things that happened during production of the following. Uh, so here's a question for you. Can you, uh, does anybody play the following or not? Can you yeah, <laughs> okay, so quite a, lot, quite a lot of people, but I'm going to be explaining more then. So uh, Dying Light, the following is an expansion to Dying Light. It happens like uh, a couple months after the events of the first game, and it's all about Kyle Crane following on on a rumor that in a countryside outside Haran, uh, there are, there's a group of people who don't get infected even though they're bitten. So he's looking for a cure for those, all those people that he has to left, leave behind. So I'm going to tell you something about, the uh, about problems that we face in production, so unexpected roadblocks that we hit. Uh, in terms of narration, in terms of storytelling, in terms of how we approach the way we we're writing quests and story for the game. Uh, so. Please, 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 please remember that this is not a post-mortem. It's not a post-mortem. It's a very personal uh, experience. It's, it's going to be about very personal experience that uh, made me come up with a very personal method of handling some types of situations that you can't face during production, that you can't face during, uh, like, things you can't, uh, can't really foresee, that you have no idea that they will happen. And so I need to figure out a way. Uh, I, need to, uh, I had to find a way to just... Uh, Try to handle them with us as le uh, in a, as uh, shit, sorry, uh, in an efficient manner. So uh, we're gonna talk a lot about challenge assumptions. But before we get to challenging anything, we need to understand. We need to get uh, some definitions out of the way. So an assumption is something accepted as true or bound to happen when there's no evidence to the contrary. So it's very similar to something called an opinion, because opinions uh, are views or judgments formed about something not necessarily based on fact or knowledge. So the point is that opinions can be uh, formed, can be based on assumptions. And this is a problem, because if you talk, uh, if we... Uh, if we share opinions, and we tend to do it a lot, because we're opinionated people in game development, uh, then we can get into crazy, crazy, crazy conversations that lead nowhere. So just very basic examples of something you pro all probably uh, had to uh, go through on a daily basis sometime. Uh, so one, one example is that uh, somebody can say that uh, Video games are gonna turn you into a killer, a murderer, and a bloodthirsty, thirsty bastard. And so, this is an opinion. It's a stupid opinion, but it's an opinion based on the assumption that all video games are about killing demons on Mars. I wish they were, but they're not. And so, you can show those people uh, a game like Journey, and it makes like it's obvious that their opinion's invalid. It's bullshit. You have proof. You have evidence that not every single game is about killing. So. Will Journey turn you into mass murderer? It's probably not. So you have a different brand of people. Like people can say, oh, I don't like video games. And so it's also an opinion. It's based on the assumption that no video game, like, like th there are no video games out there that I can like. Uh, and that's a problem. Like, because if you ever read this book, it's called Blue Ocean Strategy, recommend it, uh, then you know that this, kind, this brand of people who say they don't like video games are precisely the market that you should target. And you're probably called Nintendo then, and, you, uh, and it turns out that when you play with sports on Wii, your parents are kicking your ass in video games because they're better at it. So uh, if you're 
like, uh, if you stop talking about, uh, when you talk about opinions, even stupid opinions, if you share them among friends, it's all cool because, well, we talk about tastes. I can say that my uh, lead level designer has a shitty taste in music. <laughs> but but it's, <laughs> it's all cool. Uh, but the problem is that when you start, uh, if you start trying to, uh, if you try to design, and your design is based on assumptions that you don't really acknowledge. Like, if you have an opinion that this is going to work well, but it's, it, you don't know, you don't have proof, you just say so, and you start designing with it, then this can lead to a lot of frustration. Because you'll hit crazy roadblocks that are just proof that you're wrong, and it's hard to admit that you're wrong. So, in order to get to uh, challenging assumptions, I decided I, I wanted to do this, uh, a very general talk. I wanted to do something very general, big, but then I saw that uh, we should probably talk about very specific examples. So, I'm going to talk about specific examples of feedback. Because <laughs> feedback is a very particular brand of opinion that can be very harmful if you don't know how to handle it or if you don't know how to approach it when you get it. So when we were working on the following, uh, Kyle Crane entered the, uh, entered the countryside outside Haran and he needed to find a cure for the virus. He needed to find those people who don't get infected. And so he approached uh, a community of people who should have known more about it, who, should, who could have guided him to, to the truth. But the problem was that uh, they didn't really want to talk to him. They didn't trust him. So the whole structure of the game at some point in one of the early iterations of, the, uh, of what we were working with was that Kyle Crane had to uh, solve their problems. And as you can see on this beautiful screenshot, uh, a lot of the problems resolved around, uh, revolved around water. They had a lot of water-related problems. They didn't have, uh, didn't have uh, clean water, so they were getting feverish, uh, they were getting sick. We had all this crazy stuff happening because of water. So, Cat Crane had to uh, earn the trust of those people by helping them, essentially, with water problems. So, what happened is that in one of the early quests, it was a side quest at first, uh, in one of the early quests, you had to go to the pumping station that was uh, probably over on bandits or zombies, kill the zombies, turn on, turn on a valve, and then uh, go along the pipeline in order to find three spots where uh, the pipes were leaking. Uh, the, 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 the pressure caused the pipes to burst, and so uh, Cap Crane had to turn off the valves, kill some zombies in the meantime, and bam, the water was magically uh, appearing in the village. And so we had this done on a draft stage, so it was very like it was a prototype. It was then turned into a draft, so we had all of those uh, dialogue and stuff. Uh, but then we got to feedback, and the feedback was very bad. Uh, that's what that's what we got. So we started thinking uh, uh, because in terms of narration, everything that happened was that uh, the player had to go there and do this, and what he had to actually do uh, was turn on the valve. Like, so players felt like plumbers. That's, that's all they felt. That I'm not a hero here. I'm not helping anyone. I'm actually a plumber. So we got to thinking, what, what, what can we do about it? So we had a quest structure. We didn't really want to touch it because it's, the more you touch, the more you uh, change quests, the more difficult it gets. So we started thinking about what can we do to improve, improve this uh, in terms of narration. So uh, we were asking ourselves, uh, Pretty relevant question. So why, why why do players like our playtesters or whoever why do they feel like plumbers when everything in this village depends on the on players solving this problem? You are essentially playing the role of hero because you save a whole community of people. But why do you feel like a plumber? And so. Uh, we said that maybe the quest initiation doesn't have a hook, or maybe the dialogue is bad. So we started including hooks. We started like trying to present the situation to players as it was something amazing, that turning on this valve, that turning on the water is going to be amazing. And then we started writing better dialogue, which we iterated dialogue. And what happened is, yeah, we did ad hook, write better dialogue, simple solution. But what, ha what happened is that the feedback was also bad. So uh, we started thinking again. We're still trying to solve this, uh, the, the problem in the same manner. So we started adding more reasons for doing this thing, more explanations, more, uh, more uh, details in the dialogue on how to do this, why it's going to be cool, why it's going to be interesting and amazing. And all, of course, the feedback was bad. So we got back to thinking again. And what we did is we decided to try a different approach. We tried to, uh, tried to do it differently. And what we did is that uh, like our solution was that people just don't understand why is this important. People 
uh, we are telling them that this is a problem, but nothing in the world actually tells them it's a problem. Nobody reacts to it. It's unbelievable. So we started adding ver various details. We were starting to show visible consequences of that, uh, of that water problem. Uh, for example, we had a barn in which well, people were lying sick and they were complaining about water. We started doing all this environmental detail and so on and so on and so on. We did, even created some scenes where people were scattered around the village and were all talking about water. And <laughs> that was like, that was a problem because not only players felt like plumbers after they actually tried it, but now everything in the world was telling them to be them. Like everything was telling them, be a plumber, help those people. So, of course, uh, we got down to thinking again. So now we started, uh, finally, we, uh, because of one thing, like actually because of one thing that happened, and it's called frustration, we started asking ourselves the right questions. We started asking us, uh, ourselves, why is this happening? What went wrong? Why are we running in circles trying to solve a certain situation and we're constantly hitting roadblocks? Why can't we solve it once and for all? And so the problem was that uh, the feedback was a problem. But, but, don't, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, uh, a hall full of, full of artists who <laughs> don't like getting feedback. Okay, feedback is crucial. Feedback is amazing. I love getting feedback, and uh, feedback is, if you are an artist and you think that you don't require fee uh, any feedback because you're amazing, then you're a liar. <laughs> I should probably stop doing what you're doing, but this quality is bad. So, <laughs> Or maybe you're a multimillionaire like Rolling and your books get that big because nobody even dares to edit you. And that's also bad. So the feedback itself was great. The feed feedback was amazing. We were just spot on. The people who were giving us feedback saying, this is shit, man, uh, they were right. It was shit. But uh, what was actually wrong with feedback was the way we approached it. Uh, what we did is like we, we forgot that feedback can be just an opinion. And as we know, opinion, it doesn't have to be based on fact and knowledge. It can be an impression. P people can say, man, this is shit. I don't know why, but, it, but this is shit. So opinion, in turn, like feedback that you get, can be an opinion, and it's an opinion about the effect that you get. Because you, as the creator, you should know all the facts, or the, you should have the knowledge, and you should realize why do you get the effect. And so then, that's when we started to focus on the cause. Because no feedback could direct us to the cause. We had to find it ourselves. So we started thinking, why did we end up with this situation? Why this shit happened? And so, obviously, there's not enough time. When there's not enough time, there's never enough time during production, uh, you start to use very quick and easy solutions. You start to use something that worked well in the past, and you just translate it to the new, uh, if, you're, uh, if you have time to translate it, uh, to the new situation. Sometimes you just use the things that worked, so they will work again. Probably they're not. Uh, so, we used quick and easy solutions that tended to work in the past. So, we wanted, uh, the second thing that went wrong is that we wanted to solve feedback, not the real problem. That's like one of the mistakes the creators tend to make. They try to address feedback, not the problem. And that's bad because uh, when you have a direction that causes a lot of consequences that you don't really like, you don't want, then by painting this direction into a different color, addressing feedback is going to lead to another set of consequences that you're not going to like. So, uh, the, real, the, the real thing that we started to do is we, we tried to get to the bottom. We started to understand the problem. And we re realized that at the bottom of this problem is an assumption that we made. And the assumption was very simple. Uh, the assumption was that since pretty much every single quest that we have in the game resolves around the needs of the community, then what we have to do in order to make players care about this, in order to make those quests good in terms of narration, we need to make, we need to, uh, players need to care. We need to make the players care about the needs of the community. And so, <laughs> one of the things that went wrong is that we had a cat scene that we didn't really want to move, and this cat scene ended in a very, very weird, uh, weird dialogue when Kyle Crane says, fucking hell, why won't anybody here help me? The virus is all over the city, people are dying. And this guy, he's the village leader, Jazir. What he replies to that is, uh, and yet you still live. Take some bread, my friend, and go back to Haran. No one wants you here. And when you hear this from one of the most crucial NPCs in the game, uh, then you, you essentially land in full-blown Kanye mode, and you realize that it's a very bad way to start the conversation. Because how do you get from that? How, how do you get further from that? How do you try to make a relationship with this, with this person? 
He doesn't like you. He doesn't want to talk to you. So say, yeah, fuck you, man. I'm going on my own adventure. So uh, what we tried to do, actually, we had some unmovable blocks. It was like it was production. So you have some things that need to stay, some, some needs that you can tweak. But like the more you change, the more people uh, out there will hate you. So we tried to ch challenge this assumption. So we said, uh, players won't care about the needs of the community. That's one. Of th th that's like an opinion. And like we said, no, players don't care. They don't care about the water problems. But what we realized when he said that, when he phrased the problem that way, was that they won't care about the needs of the community. And this is important. They won't care about the water problem. What can, they, what can we try to achieve? What can we try to make them do? That we can try to make them care about the community. And that was, the, that, that was when we challenged this assumption about the needs of the community and we got back to the community itself, that when it all started to make sense. So we had to figure out how to do it. And there was a cool thing that it happened by luck. I don't know how it happened, but our, <laughs> our art director at some point, in a stroke of genius, that was brilliant, he introduced a character to the script. He introduced, uh, I have this, it's cool. Uh, he introduced this girl. And before the moment you enter the barn and you're about to talk with this guy for the first time, they are arguing and you realize that this is his daughter. So they have some tension there and you are going, essentially going to get the same tension just in a moment. You're going to feel the same thing that she feels. So our art director introduced this character, I think in order to add some humanity to Jazir because he felt kind of robotic, but he solved a lot of problems with this one character because he introduced someone who's essentially in the same position that the player is going to be in. So we started working on, started developing this character. We uh, came up with Esgi, and uh, everybody in the de de development team, I think, loved her. She, she, everybody loved working on her because she's like, she, she's a different character. We don't have characters like that in Dying Light, so it was very re refreshing to work on her. And so we had Esgi, and the moment you first had a ch when you had a chance to talk to her for the first time, uh, it was a different situation. She was not so annoyed with you, like her father. He has a lot on his mind, like he has a lot on his mind. So, but she was playful. The moment I started talking with her, she was playful. She was saying, oh, you're looking for Khan, he's gone. I guess they finally asked him to leave. And he, uh, you have questions like, what does it mean that they asked him to leave? Why this character disappeared because they asked him to leave? What? So we start bringing questions with her being playful. She's not really angry at you. She doesn't treat you like garbage. She's testing out waters. She's trying to understand who you are, man. And so uh, then, pretty much in the, in the middle of her dialogue, she starts challenging you. She says, you're here for the same reason that this guy was, same reason the bandits won't leave us alone, right? We're supposed to trust you? So we're shifting, uh, we were shifting the balance from players caring about the needs of community to the balance of people needing to, tr to earn the trust of those people. That was a crucial thing because we could stress this out in every single dialogue that led to any other quest. And so even though players, like we changed the quest, we, it, the quest became uh, like amazing. We turned this uh, water-related uh, quest with the pumping station into one of the main quests because it's so cool. Because when we shifted our approach, and we just changed like four valves and one valve at the end of the, uh, of the whole quest. We had all those cool pipes bursting and you just ride, uh, ride with your buggy and uh, the, the water is trying to splash at you and so on. Uh, people essentially were plumbers still, but I didn't care because it was, suddenly it made sense. And so when they got back, this dude changed his tune. He said, maybe I was wrong about you, stranger. Maybe you can start a relationship. Maybe this can be a beginning of a beautiful friendship. So, uh, so everything changed, and we got this done in two quests. And before we challenged this assumption, we couldn't get it done with like 12 quests. So the problem is that that's not all. Uh, the bigger problem that we realized only after we got that done, and after we got that out of the way, is that we realized that one of the biggest problems that we have is, in, is one of the design principles of making an action game. One of the design principles of making an action game is that players need to get clear, understandable objectives. They always need to know what to do and what, what, what do we expect of them, what they need to achieve. But that's also an assumption, actually. When you take a look at one of my favorite games, Dark Souls, it's an action game. It is a AAA production and it, is mass market, like it sells millions of copies. And <laughs> it gives you everything but not this. So, uh, but let's say, 
American design says that players need to get clear and understandable objective. So when you try to break it down with logic in terms of narration in games, is that when players need to get clear and understandable objectives in order to do quests, which are given by NPCs, NPCs give us objectives by talking, this is such a dialogue. So this essentially leads us to the conclusion that dialogue should give clear and understandable objectives. The problem is that when every single person you meet is talking about this, or plenty of different people, and even the world tells you about this, that's a problem because essentially everyone is telling you to be a plumber, to solve a problem, and the problem is that dialogue doesn't work that way. People don't speak that way. What you are creating is an army of crazy monsters, alien line forms, which are focused on one problem, and they are trying to force you into caring about this thing. So we had to change dialogue in a different manner than before. We didn't need to make people engaged and interested in the problem. We needed to make people interested in the people. So that was one of the hardest assumptions to uh, get out of the way. So we exchanged this, uh, like, you know, scenes with people who were talking about water problems, into, like, let's say, one dialogue with Esgi, in which she, for the majority of this dialogue, she's talking about herself, herself, about you, about the situation that you're in. She's very playful, and then in the end, here's, here's, the, here's the objective. Here's the, what you need to do. Groundwater has got polluted a while back. Imagine what would happen if you get our water running again. That's the only thing you get about the quest. And now she's here, she's trying to actively discourage you from going there. She's playing on those hero vibes. So you want to do this? Mm -mm -mm. I want to do this? I will do it. So uh, she's saying you have a death wish. She's interested in you. She, she, she treats you like an outsider, and that's why like, she's an outsider like you too. She, she, also, she finds it interesting because you actually try to actively do something around this village. And she hates those people who are around her because they never do anything. If you click again, uh, the X again on her, then you get another dialogue which explains her attitude towards the people. But let's say you don't care. So you get this objective, uh, objective that you need to do in one line of dialogue instead of like crazy amount of people talking about this. So yeah, finally, finally we got that. The uh, finally got a good feedback. The quest, pre like the changed version uh, of the quest uh, that we ended up with at the end is in the final product. So you can play it and you can see for yourself knowing all the tricks that we included in that. But uh, the point is that when you you, you realize that there's an assumption before any direction that you follow, and you change the assumption, then you get to another direction. You get to another direction that will create a, like, a, different set of, uh, a different set of problems or whatever, but you skip everything that you're fighting with entirely. Instead of running with circles, you start running in a different direction, and that's, that can be amazing. That can be something like that, that will unblock you and that will cure, cure your frustration with the project and the feedback that you get. And so, uh, one of the crucial problems that's, uh, that you can face is that uh, you also make assumptions. You have your personal bias, your personal taste, you make assumptions whenever you design something, whenever you write, you also, you're not a perfect human being, so you also work on opinions. So for example, uh, every single design I make, like when, when I try to, uh, to figure out w what I'm coming from, it's like every single design I make is, uh, will be uh, polluted by assumptions that I make. And so. Uh, like, I think that certain things require no explanation, and explaining them is a waste of time of a writer, and more importantly, the player. So if you're trying to explain something that people will just get, or they don't care, you're wasting their time. So it's a waste of time to give a fresh coat of paint to fetch quests in order to make it better. It is and will be a fetch quest, so you can treat it like that. You don't really need lines of dialogue explaining why you should care about collecting five red frogs. Anybody play this game? It's an amazing game about the road trip of a Prince Noctis and his friends. You actually couldn't <laughs> hunt for frogs and you have dialogues about this. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I think the story structure of a movie usually translates to a rather bad video game story. I don't like video games structured like movies, and I'm trying to avoid this. I know that in every single discussion that I will have, I'll try to question this uh, whenever something, someone tries to actively do, do something like resembling a movie. Uh, I think like personal stories of players, uh, I prefer them prefer whatever players do to whatever I can come up with. If you want to play the Witcher and use your horse in order to get on top of a tree, that's a cool story, man. It's an amazing story. If you're playing Skyrim and you don't care about all this politics and stuff, and you just want to find crazy bugs, it's amazing. I love it. Uh, 
Also, I think that players are smarter, smarter than we think they are. And quite often, we tend to blame them for our faulty design decisions. We tend to blame players for being stupid when they don't understand our stupid tutorials. Maybe they are bored. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they don't want to read text about pressing X to jump or whatever. They're not stupid. We are stupid for kidding. They will care about that. So the last thing is, like, I think players see more value in fun they found on their own than whatever we directed them to. So it's, it's like, these are assumptions that I make. It's, the list is bigger. But <laughs> whenever I do something, I try to like, self-check whether I'm actually trying to do something better or am I pushing my, my own agenda. So please like, be aware of that. And your personal bias can be dangerous because every single assumption in design can be dangerous, because uh, when you design based on assumptions, you can design something that lacks foundation. And when something lacks foundation, it will collapse. It can lead to a catastrophe. And so it's relatively easy to avoid when you're working with something really um, concrete, like gameplay. Gameplay is easy to prototype. Gameplay is easy to tweak. When you decide that you will add another gun, then you add another gun, you shoot it, you tweak animations, you tweak sounds, and you see, oh, that gun is fun, or no, that gun is shit, let's cut it. You have evidence for whatever you do in gameplay. But the problem is that, uh, the problem is that, how the hell do you prototype the narrative layer of the game? How the hell do you prototype narrative when everything that you do, every assumption that you make, seems perfectly reasonable? When everything seems Good, it's just like, if it makes sense, then how the hell do you prototype it in order to find mistakes that you will make? So an example, uh, an example that we had was that whenever, when we started working on the intro, introduction to Dying Light, the following, we assumed that since it's an expansion, then players should know what happened between Dying Light and the following. So we started writing the introduction with that in mind. And so the problem is that the original cutscene was damn long. And when we started like, looking at it, we said that it, has, it contains 18 bits of information, it lasts for, like, let's say, three minutes, and people are so overwhelmed that they remember nothing. So the feedback that we got internally, fortunately, it was that it's bad. We can't let this happen. And so we started working on lines, of course. We started tweaking the lines, we started cutting some info, we started doing this and that and that, we were wasting time. But then we got back to this, we got back to the assumption, and the assumption was that players need to know what happened between Dying Light and the following. And the right question to ask is, why? And do they? So <laughs> do they need to know this? Uh, let's say no. Let's change this assumption. Players don't need to know this. And then you get back to like, actually trying to understand your product. What is this game actually about? This game is about people who don't get infected in a countryside outside Haran, where <laughs> which shit's going on, probably because of some, someone called the mother in terms of narration. That's, what, that's your story. So uh, what happened when you started actually rewriting this by changing this, the baseline, the changing the assumption, is we decided to focus on what players don't know. We decided to turn it into curiosity instead of exposition. And we ended up with a very short cutscene, which also served as a, a, as a story trailer. Because it was just OK. Uh, but that was a mistake. It's not always so good that we'll solve every problem by just changing assumptions. The mistake that we made is that we forgot about a very crucial thing. Is that when you change the assumption and you lead to a different direction, it will have their own, its own set of consequences. So bits of information that we cut from the introduction were sometimes referenced in the script. They were referenced seven hours later or something like that. And people had no idea what happened to Dr. Camden and our uh, important characters from Dying Light. So we cut something in order to make something cool. We wanted a cool introduction that would just make you, oh man, I want to find this cure. But it turned out that we created a different set of problems which led, for example, to a weaker ending. So that was the problem. So to wrap it up, Whenever you try talking about opinions, then it's okay when you talk about fr among friends or on the internet or whatever. When you try to work with them, it can create a huge load of problems, especially uh, so. In order to avoid this, always try to understand what people mean, not what they say, because they can say a lot of different, pe uh, a lot of different things, but they may not realize that w what they actually mean. So then try to find out why people mean what they say, because there's a lot of different reasons for making assumptions in video game development. It's like the, the, pro, the, the 
products we work on are so crazy complicated, they're so hard that to do, uh, that people have plenty of reasons to actually make assumptions because we want to confine the design space. You can assume that everyone is going to play with headphones on and then you forget about people who can't hear or people who just listen to podcasts when you play the game. And you can design a level that ba is entirely based on audio cues and people have no idea how to play it because they don't care about your sound. They want to listen to podcasts and kill whatever. So there's a lot of different reasons why people say that, why people mean something. And so you can say, uh, Jesus, dude, you're a stupid idiot. Why didn't you think about that? But he's not an idiot. He has his work to do. You have your work to do. It's crazy complicated. So assume that this, you can assume, but it's a fact actually, that uh, they have a lot, of, a lot of stuff to do so you can help them or be a problem. But Another thing is that whenever you find feedback, feedback can be very dangerous. It can kill you. It can, like, it, it can destroy you. But whenever you get feedback, please remember that focus on the cause of this feedback. Try to solve the cause, not the effect. And so how to do it? Like, in very simple bullet points, the summary of this whole thing is that whenever I see a problem, uh, I try to take a, st 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 take a step back, uh, understand the assumption that, will, that caused the problem, Decide if I can live with it, because sometimes you learn to live with it. You, you need to. You can't be everywhere. You can solve everything, and sometimes you're just not right. And if I can't live with it, uh, I try to challenge this assumption and try to find a way to prove that we can do better. Because it's not about you being right, saying, yeah, here's my, here's my work, man. I'm better. I'm right. No, it's about saying, guys, we can do it better. Like, I will I spend my time thinking about this. Here's the solution. If you just... If we just try, if we just try to prototype this to see if it works, we can get to amazing stuff. So that's it. And question everything then, but why? Uh, for quality, as I explained, for clarity, because you can get into a crazy mess of people assuming that they're idiots, that you hate them, or that they you can assume that they hate you, whatever, because they're communicating in a wrong way, because they're talking about opinions, and not, not, you're not trying to solve the problem. You're trying to prove I'm better than you, or whatever like that. And then for efficiency, because all those running in circles, when we are trying to solve dialogue, when, when we are trying to solve feedback, not the problem, because there's a lot of time, and time, translates directly into cash and development and also quality because the more time you have, the better stuff you can do. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we still have some time for questions from the audience. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, that's a good solution, though. <laughs> that's good. I will use it. <laughs> and then you have an escort mission, and as you know, escort mission in games are not not very good, right? <laughs> hmm? That's yeah. Maybe you can create one that will become an evidence that they don't have to. <laughs> a challenge for any game designer here, like just prototype or create an escort mission that doesn't suck. And, and just... <laughs> Anyone else, any questions? If you don't have any questions, oh, yeah. Yep. Not really come back to the previous one because when you, uh, the cool thing about that is when you change the assumption and when, when you, s you actually get more info about what went wrong in the first place because you start to understand the real problem. And then even if you can't change it like completely, if you can't like destroy it, uh, then you can at least try to work around the, real, the problem that you're faced with. Because you know how to maybe just push it to the sideways and maybe do something, so you can communicate in a better way to people who like, have to work with it and so on. So you can actually, you, you don't have to challenge the assumption and actually work with the assumption that you made, even if it's probably better. Uh, you, can, you, you can actually solve the problem in a very efficient manner if you just, that's, yeah.
Uh, I, I won't. I don't want to. <laughs> like my, my approach to this is like, I, I know that it's not a very popular opinion, but my approach to that is that uh, if players want to break your game, let them break it. Because they find, uh, if they find it fun, if they think it's cool to break your game, then you can't be a, like an artist saying, dude, I hate you, you're breaking my game. No, you're making a pr product that's supposed to entertain people. If they want to break it, fine, go with it. And if you find, uh, like, and uh, of course, if you want to break any game I worked on, then just please text me and <laughs> write to me with any cool thing that you've happened. Like, sometimes you, you will have information that you need to sell to the player, right? In order to, like, it can come out during production that there is no way to solve this problem. And, it, and we made some mistakes like that in the following. Like, one of the things that I hate about what I did is I said that we need to stop players in here or just um, play an audio log of a very long letter written by someone. So they were like, people were forced to listen to like two minutes of talking, I think, because we actually needed to explain something that was really relevant later. I hated the solution because I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, what should be clear to the players that they, they should get all the information from plenty of different sources. But I, like, we couldn't do that. Like, it was too late and we had to like, uh, fix a certain plot hole. But uh, you can't plan for it. People will find a way to destroy your game and it's amazing. <laughs> it's great. Anyone, uh, if you don't want to ask questions here, then you, you can catch me uh, when, when uh, I'm, I'll be probably smoking cigarettes. And <laughs> I'll be probably drinking beer at Techland's booth for another hour or something like that. So if anyone's come over and chat, then please feel free to do that. Um, yeah, if we don't have any questions now. Mm -hmm.